you wanted to be, didn't know where to put the chair, no. unless you wanted the side, this is, this is fine. This is fine. <laughs> Good to see you. Doing well? Oh, okay. China Commission. Awesome. Awesome. That's a great place. That's a great place. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Just getting over. Okay. I didn't realize, oh, because you have too many people you have to Yes, see. yeah, yeah. So, no, you guys are our small security. We don't need them. We don't, yeah. Okay. There's a way to get, like, a second row. Yeah. Second row. Also, weirdly enough, the, the Reuters article that the Global Times pulled from misquoted the, like, quote, in quotation marks, misquoted the language. So it was just really strange. Um, I'm down. I mean, that's, I, I sound I don't like a Friday thing if we want to do a joint, but. Yeah. I don't want to piss off Mark by, like, poking the one China policy, like, narrative in the way that their legislation does. Yeah. But I'd much prefer to do it like as a press release than legislation. Honestly, I don't fucking care about this not work right now because of that shit that Shadow pulled on the floor yesterday. What did he do? He fucking knocked the Taiwan shirt back. Did you catch that? No, he, like what it was very subtle, but he was just like, I'm not pleased with how this bill references the China policy, and I understand that it was included in the negotiations. With the Senate. That's not true at all. Well, it is true. It was, a, it was a Michael Schiffer ad, and to be honest, we probably could have done away with it, but. It, it was just, I didn't put it in, I didn't put it in the text. Um, so anyway, I was not happy that we didn't get a flag that yeah, one of our members was going to criticize us, Bill, even even if it was like so subtle that only Doug Anderson and I noticed it. Yeah, I was. Um, I didn't notice it. <laughs> the other thing that I think is pretty funny is there were apparently, I don't know if it was your caucus or our caucus, but 
there's some sort of leadership discussion about whether or not we should have had a recorded vote on June 2002. Yeah. Because of the trade talks. And again, I don't know which side, because it wasn't that clear to me. But I'm like, no, if we're like telling the administration, <laughs> we shouldn't pin their policy on the norm to China, and then we do the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there was also talk seconds before we actually voice voted it as to whether or not we were going to do. So they, I think the. Well, he he wanted to ask for it for this, his other bill, um, for because his. Oh, for his but they would have. Yeah. They wanted two. Oh, oh, really? So we had, we I said ask for 2002 and the uh, econ bill yeah. because 2002 is <laughs> the more substantive. Um, oh, two meaning the angle and one of the McCalls. No, it would have been both of the McCalls. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, and then we were surprised that he didn't ask for it. Well, because because it was, it was his bill, we yeah. couldn't ask for it. It was um, it was like up. It was up for discussion in the seconds leading up to the voice vote because minority leader wanted us to pick one, oh. and we were like, okay, do the Taiwan because that was I guess pre negotiated or something. Then the member wanted the other one, so. Mm. I don't think it really matters. It's, it's unanimous, so whatever. Um, I'm happy. But yeah, that would have been. I was so also worried a little bit about the 2002 because I wondered if the shabbats of the world would have voted against it. Sure. <laughs> I don't think any. No, because no, you know, no, nobody else had that degree. You know, sort of like unreasonable view of, of the actual language. Um, the actual language just. Was a, was a reference, not an endorsement, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is extraneous, but doesn't hurt us in any way. Um, so I don't think that would have been an issue. But you never know. I mean, <laughs> several of our committee members voted against the other McCall bill. So. Why? Because they didn't understand it, apparently. Like, apparently some members thought like we were, we were creating another assistant secretary position in the State Department that didn't exist already, whereas that is not what it does. So. And they, they oppose that because, <laughs> because like policy-wise. Oh, these are like not policy wonk members. But like, you're, like, you're spending all that money. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think there was, I don't think there was that much. I don't think there was that much. I don't think there was that much thought behind it. Um, but the member was not pleased. Well, I heard, um, Ed take a call from, I'm not sure who, someone on our side complaining about it too because they thought it got into trade issues and he was like, this bill doesn't do anything, <laughs> calm down. <laughs> yeah. So it never ceases to amaze me, like the degree to which the private sector can overstate our effectiveness as a body sometimes. Like, it's gratifying, it's gratifying. It's like, my wife will be instructed to like bill for like doing hearing summaries, which here is like an intern task right. that high schoolers do. And like she she costs like six hundred dollars an hour. She's a lawyer? Yeah. It's like crazy. Um like who's paying for that Why? That's insane. Yeah. You know that like, the transcripts are publicly available. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I hoped to at least hear the opening statements, but I have two three, so it's not looking great. Yeah. I know, I'm going to be absentee for this one, too. <laughs> softly want to call dibs on uh, authorization or something like the state is doing so much yeah. like the state department authorization bill you can't call dibs on that no no no, 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 no. <laughs> like a like a small one a small authorization of some of the stuff that of some of the new stuff that states do like the china stuff yeah. just like just to sort of reaffirm what they're up to which i think is largely good um, I don't know the logistics of actually whether that's useful or doable. Mm, it has to be what, 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 what kills me is that the end of the day, the regulations process is basically on autopilot. It's basically on autopilot. Yeah. 
One, two, three, one, two, three, test, test, test. Knows he's supposed to be here. He's absent minded. Yeah. <laughs> so, Dinsha, how are, um, how are you and Zach dividing stuff up? Uh, Zach's doing all the work, I'm taking the vaccine. Okay. Enough <laughs> 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 said. He's just taking the front seat at this point. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, any. In, you know, any anything just go to him. Uh, okay. Goes, basically anything. Letters. So where is he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you walked in. Yeah. I was, I was, I was asking Dinsha, like, who is, who is breaking, how you guys are breaking up the front doors because um, I didn't think you were in the room right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's your turn. Oh, that's good. Lauren, you want to come front or go ahead? Say, Mr. Chairman. Hey. Ooh, sound like a Republican. I'm going to go first. It sounds like Donald Trump. No. I warn you because I don't know what health conditions or heart concerns you might have, but I'm going to say that. <laughs> You were cracking everybody up today. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Thank well, you. The, 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 the mother of one, actually. So the mother of one. Do you want to do your, state, your opening statement first? Yeah, whatever you want to do, boss. Sure. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, members will have five days to submit materials uh, into the record. We'll depart from press in a little bit here and hear the opening statement of uh, our ranking member and others who would want to give short opening statements and then I'll give uh, my opening statement then we'll hear from the witnesses. Mr. Yoho. Thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Uh, good morning and thank you uh, Chairman Chairman and uh, good afternoon for calling this hearing and I appreciate the opportunity to address the mounting political and economic aggression by China and discuss ways the United States and our allies can challenge their aggression. In recent years, China has experienced rapid economic growth and is currently the world's second largest economy. 
While this level of economic success would typically deserve praise, we must not forget that this growth was achieved through predatory practices that have drastically harmed other nations, including the United States. As a preeminent world leader, the United States is now engaged in a great power competition with China as the Chinese Communist Party under Xi Jinping attempts to challenge American influence and erode American security and prosperity. Xi's leadership seeks to advance China's interests, not, without, not within the prevailing global order, but at its expense. For now, it is working. China has no peer competitors along its immediate periphery to be concerned about and plenty of cash to advance its interests in other parts of the world. An example of this expansion is China's Belt Road Initiative, an effort to boost infrastructure development and economic connectivity and expand China's influence. On surface value, that sounds okay, more, uh, among more than 65 countries on three continents. But if you look deeper, you find predatory lending practices that have um, beholden other countries to give up strategic uh, ports, land, and um, uh, infrastructure. In speeches given by Xi, the leader often associates the BRI with the building, with the idea of building a community of common destiny. The party believes it is their mission to achieve a great rejuvenation while spreading socialism with Chinese characteristics, otherwise known as communism, to poor and vulnerable nations around the world. She regularly promotes this massive westward infrastructure program as a win-win undertaking that will fill infrastructure gaps in less developed countries for mutual benefit. But major components of the BRI have proven to be debt traps, predatory lending practices that endanger participant sovereignty and increases China's political influence while benefiting the corrupt officials and bringing few opportunities to the average citizen. Through these projects, China gives large, unviable loans to poor countries. When the loans aren't repaid, China seizes physical infrastructure or commodities for their own gain. In some, places, it, in some places, it also is apparent that the BRI is a cover for military expansion. Data from Centers for Global Development suggests that China has already left eight countries drowning in debt. If we do not address this situation, help other countries realize this, um, the countries in the Indo-Pacific region and around the world, uh, and if we don't offer viable alternatives, more countries will be held financially beholden to China. In response to China's economic rise, Congress and the Trump administration has been focused on tailoring American defense and economic policies to counter China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific region and show Beijing that the international community recognizes China imperial ambition and is determined to stand against it. American investment alternatives, such as the BUILD Act, which received wide bipartisan support and was signed into law by President Trump in 2018, will advance U.S. influences in developing countries by incentivizing private investments as an alternative to state-directed investment projects like the BRI. It is important that developing nations around the world are given investment alternatives that do not leave the economically and politically indebted to China. We must continue to craft policies that create environments conducive to democratic ideals and free market economic growth that are resistant to aggression by com um, communist powers like China. I, like f I look forward to hearing from these witnesses today and discussing solutions to counter China's aggression and preserve not just American influence in the Indo-Pacific region, but to empower nations to empower their people to grow economically and have free will in their nations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Does anyone else uh, seek time to make an opening statement? Um, my God, I've never seen such a shy group <laughs> really? of members of. Yes, well, I've got uh, a few things. I know this will shock to you, a few things to say. Uh, the trade deficit we have with China is the largest trade deficit in the history of mammalian life. Uh, for several decades, we had administrations telling us uh, to ignore it, uh, not worry about it, and that it didn't matter. Uh, but we've lost uh, 3.4 million jobs as a result of it, and it puts China in a tremendous position of power over the United States. Although we have power over them, we could deny them access to our markets, 
something that uh, we have up until now been reluctant to do. Uh, I, uh, my record is not one of unswavering support for the current occupant of the White House, but uh, I want to commend uh, the president for at least focusing our attention on uh, China's uh, uh, unfair trade practices and the uh, horrific results to the United States. Unfortunately, one would expect that in areas of the uh, national security, the powerful interests at the Pentagon would control our policy, and they see a real opportunity. Fan the concerns about the South China Sea, exaggerate them, and justify multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred billion dollar increases in the Pentagon budget. There are literally dozens of uh, ter uh, disputes involving uh, uh, sea territory and control. Uh, there's a major one between Timor and Australia that somehow the United States doesn't get concerned with. But somehow those affecting China uh, are matters of great principle while we ignore all the others. These islets in the South China Sea, etc., have not been inhabited, you know, although they're off the shores of t uh, the most teeming populated continent in the world, for good reason. There's no reason to be there. They're useless. There's no oil. If there was oil, it wouldn't be ours, and there's no oil. Uh, trillions of dollars of trade go close to those islands, yes, in and out of Chinese ports. And if China were to control these islands, they could blockade their own ports. Uh, there may be a few oil tankers that get close to these islands that could easily not get close to these islands on their way to Japan or South Korea. But we're told the idea way to get tough with China is to ignore the devastation done especially to our Midwest by their trade policies and instead spend a few hundred billion dollars uh, fighting uh, over islets that are both useless and in any case not ours. Um, as Wall Street has tremendous power over our economic policy. They would like us to do a few things to increase their profits, uh, which coincidentally might create a few jobs, but they basically want us to go back to the policies of ignoring China's wrongdoing altogether. Um, we had a policy all of last century never to grant most favored nation status to a managed economy because we understood that a managed economy will manage to exclude our exports in so many different ways uh, that just getting them to agree to reduce their tariffs is a, uh, is a fiction. But this fiction turned out to be useful, and many hundreds of billions, many hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars have been made uh, as a result of granting most favored nation status to China, which I might add 65% of all Democrats voted against at the time. Uh, we were right then. We shouldn't change now just because Trump also seems to be interested. Um, so, for example, uh, if we want to sell airplanes to a Chinese airline, that airline can, the government, if the government said uh, you have to build a factory here, that might violate WTO. We'd never be able to prove it because they'd say it orally. But instead, the airline says it, pretty much the same thing as government, they're in government control. That may not even be a violation about WTO, still can't prove it, it's done orally. So what happens? Boeing is forced to move a factory to China in order to have access to those exports. So even in those cases where we have some exports, they've got control. And so that's one way they control us. They control us because they are a substantial market that market is not open to the extent they accept American exports. They do so only through, uh, by demanding a chance to, to turn American businesses into their pawns. Um, another example of this is Hollywood. We don't have access to their market. We have, they limit us to 35, 40 different pictures. So every studio is turning over trying to figure out how to get one of their pictures in. So which studio is going to make a movie about Tibet? I think Richard Gere may go a long time before he makes a sequel. No Hollywood studio dares offend Beijing because 
Beijing controls access to their market, and we accept it. Um, they, uh, 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 a couple of uh, narrow areas to focus on. One is the Uyghurs, the ranking member, and I uh, have uh, introduced the Uyghur Act of uh, 2019. Um, not only does this focus on US, the use of U.S. technology uh, to commit violations of human rights, but it also focuses on the Chinese government surveillance of the Chinese diaspora in the United States, especially the Uyghur diaspora. And of course, I introduced the uh, U.S.-China Economic Security and Review Act, along with Congressman Gallagher, to examine Chinese influence uh, on the United States. But China is one of the biggest markets in the world. That's what we're told over and over. It happens to be true. They control access, and any American company that doesn't do their bidding can be cut off from access. That is what we're up against, and that is why we do not need a rules-based system with China. We can never enforce those rules. We need a results-based system where for every billion dollars of, of goods they send us, they have to accept a billion dollars of U.S. exports. If they're not willing to do that, then they will simply prove to us what we knew all of last century, and that is you cannot have a rules-based system with a managed economy. If you do that, they'll control trade, they'll control access to their markets, and they'll control your companies. We've spent 20 years proving how right we used to be. And with that, uh, let, I'll once again ask to see if there's anyone else who has an opening statement. Seeing none, we'll go to our witnesses. Uh, the uh, first is uh, Shamila uh, Kodri, a senior South Asia fellow at the uh, New America, and uh, at, at New America, and a senior advisor at uh, John Hopkins University School of Advanced Studies. Please give us a five-minute summary, and we'll move on to the next witness. And your entire statement, without objection, for all witnesses will be put into the record. There it is. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I'll, I'll be discussing Chinese influence in Asia with a focus on Pakistan, and the views I'm expressing today here are my own. And I'm going to start with a quote from a contact of mine in Pakistan. Maybe about 10 years ago, America was an important voice. Today, America sounds like a very distant voice. There is a striking view over here that the sun is rising in the east and setting in the, in the west. And this view has multiple manifestations, which the chairman spoke about already, that we're seeing globally, and they're happening in Pakistan as well. The visible increase of Chinese nationals in the country. The arrivals desk at the airport in Islamabad designated for Chinese nationals. Chinese language schools, a Chinese-operated port, and Chinese participation in Pakistani security politics, like they've never done before. All this takes place under the umbrella of CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, a collection of infrastructure and development projects intended to improve trade and investment. In Pakistan, a once dominant United States is now overshadowed by growing Chinese influence, for which CPEC is the primary vehicle. Should we welcome this as the United States? We should, to a certain extent. China's intentions to fix Pakistan's economy and fight Islamic radicalism help us. After all, we attempted to do the very same thing in South Asia after 9-11, but did not accomplish such goals. During those years, the United States encouraged China to get more involved in stabilizing Pakistan. Those requests have been answered, and we must now contend with their consequences, in particular on geopolitics and security. While U.S. and Chinese security interests in South Asia may seem to overlap at the moment, they are by no means shared. The two countries view terrorism and terrorist actors differently. China remains singularly focused on militants that impact only their stability and their business interests. CPEC, meanwhile, hurts U.S. regional interests by disrupting fragile India-Pakistan ties, a nuclear fuel dynamic that demands U.S. stewardship from time to time during times of crisis. China's provision of surveillance data collection capabilities, and new hardware to the Pakistani military may seem like it improves security, 
but such tools also increase the likelihood of invasive data collection, misuse of information, and violations of privacy. The notion that the Pakistani military might start to mimic Chinese authoritarianism is no longer theoretical. Pakistani civil society and media report more aggressive tactics by the military to silence critical voices. They share a common refrain, that the military is more powerful than ever, and that's because of China. China plays a game familiar to the United States, which also strengthened Pakistan's military after 9-11. However, it did so alongside an international community that shared an understanding of the threat, values, and burden associated with fixing the problem. Today in Pakistan, Chinese influence stands alone, changing the rules of the game for everyone else. For example, Pakistan no longer publicly discloses the terms of its loans from China. Indeed, CPEC portends immense geoeconomic and geopolitical advantages for China and Pakistan, but its repercussions will dwarf any comparable American influence. At present, the Trump administration has tough rhetoric and a collection of policies that address aspects of China's rise, but it does not have the political will, financial resources, ability to assume risks, and interest-based vision of South Asia needed to compete with Chinese influence a la CPEC. Instead, the United States has reduced its policy to a singular thread, ending the war in Afghanistan. And while it's appropriate at the moment, over time, that singular focus will lock the United States out of productive channels of engagement with Pakistan that China will have already strengthened. Countering this means going beyond Afghanistan and even complementing CPEC's economic efforts. To protect US geopolitical options in the future, the US should also support Pakistani and regional actors most threatened by Chinese influence. Ultimately, countering Chinese, China's rise will require the United States to create policies that both address and benefit from the needs of other countries. To be clear, a revitalized American approach to Pakistan and South Asia should not aim to replace China. Instead, follow its example. China's engagements in the region show it is not playing a zero-sum game, and neither should the United States. Otherwise, America will isolate itself from a historical process of regional economic integration. And by the way, the door is not shut in Pakistan, where government officials and political leaders still privately hope for sustained American attention in the country, and ironically are using China to get it. The US should take note and start to make policies that ensure it does not become an afterthought in South Asia's new competitive geopolitical environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dan uh, Kleiman, Dr. Dan Kleiman, uh, when we invited him, was uh, with the Center for a New American Secur for New American Security. Uh, I believe uh, just yesterday he became director of the Asia Pacific Security Program at uh, CNAS. Uh, Dr. Kleinman. Thank you very much, Chairman Sherman, Ranking Member Yoho, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be here today to speak to China's expanding influence in the Indo-Pacific. Today, I will focus my remarks on Southeast Asia. If Southeast Asia succumbs to China's vision of a world defined by might makes right, might makes right, state-driven economic interactions, and creeping authoritarianism, America's approach to the larger challenge posed by China in the Indo-Pacific and beyond will encounter a significant setback. Conversely, if most nations in Southeast Asia can chart their own freedom of choice and move toward more democratic types of governance, the United States will demonstrate in Beijing's periphery that a rules-based order can still endure. The stakes could not be higher. I want to now make five quick observations about the regional state of play. First, Beijing has adopted an approach to Southeast Asia that leverages every instrument of national power. Second, Physical and digital connectivity has emerged as a key component of China's approach to the region. Third, China is corroding democracy in Southeast Asia. Under what it now calls the Digital Silk Road, China is exporting technology to the region for surveillance and censorship and also promoting its model of online governance. Fourth, Southeast Asia generally perceives that China has momentum on its side, which brings me to my fifth point. 
that the reality is more nuanced. The United States retains significant strengths in the region, both diplomatic and economic, and most countries in Southeast Asia do not want to see a Chinese sphere of influence extended over their region. Today, America's approach to Southeast Asia contains a number of promising areas, but fall well short, falls well short of matching the scope and scale of the China challenge. Here are 10 steps that Congress could take to strengthen America's approach going forward. First, Congress should appropriate resources to establish a new US Digital Development Fund that would support information connectivity projects across the developing world, including in Southeast Asia. This fund, potentially through leveraging lines of credit, could drive down the price of American digital infrastructure to the point where they could compete with Chinese companies like Huawei. Second, Congress, through its oversight function, should encourage the executive branch to come together with US ally and partner governments around an international certif certification for high quality infrastructure. A clear set of criteria defining high quality would both help US firms differentiate what they offer and also serve as a basis for countries in Southeast Asia to evaluate potential Chinese projects. Third, Congress should convey, convene a hearing to weigh the merits of future high quality multilateral trade and investment agreements. Fourth, Congress should host U.S. industry executives to explore the possibility of opening a wing of a marquee U.S. hospital in the Philippines or Indonesia. Given the lack of a world-class world -class health system in these countries, a U.S. medical presence would deliver significant diplomatic payoffs. Fifth, Congress should appropriate additional funds to enhance youth engagement with Southeast Asia as people-to-people -people ties are fundamental to U.S. engagement with the region. Sixth, congressional delegations to Tokyo, Canberra, and New Delhi should emphasize the importance of cooperation with these countries in Southeast Asia. Seventh, Congress should send a letter to the Secretary of Defense requesting a classified briefing on U.S. military op options to supplement freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. During this briefing, members should encourage the department to deploy new types of capabilities to the region that demonstrate the flexibility of America's military presence. Eighth, Congress, recognizing Vietnam's strategic importance should exempt it from CATSA sanctions and also hold a hearing on how to strike the right balance between advancing America's relationship with Hanoi and also upholding human rights. Ninth, Congress should submit a letter to the Secretary of State to request an update on the U.S. government's efforts to help countries in Southeast Asia both detect and counter Chinese disinformation campaigns. And then tenth and finally, Congress should appropriate additional resources to strengthening civil society, rule of law, and freedom of the press in Southeast Asia. Even a modest increase in U.S. funding would go a long way towards shoring up these countries against China's influence. I'll end there and thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, and I'm particularly interested in the idea of the U.S. government setting standards for uh, a high quality infrastructure. That was perhaps the least expensive, but I think one of the most intriguing of your suggestions. Uh, we'll now go on to uh, Peter Mattis, who is a research fellow in uh, China studies at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Sherman, Ranking Member Yoho, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee. It's a pleasure and an honor to return to the subcommittee today to speak on this particular topic. Make a few points before going on to, to the impact on the United States. The first is that the Chinese Communist Party attempts to build political influence on a global scale to bring about, first, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which essentially means China's rise on its terms in its way while maintaining its own political system. And the second is to keep the Chinese Communist Party in power to do that. The party's view of threat is driven by, is defined by its absence, to the, the absence of threats to the party's ability to govern, which when you think about that, is a very expansive definition. We think of national security as being our ability to manage threats and resilience in the face of catastrophe. The absence of threats 
is a never-ending goal that forces them to look outward. The second aspect of it that is important is that threats to the party's ability to govern includes the world of ideas. What, is the, what does the party say that those ideas are that are threatening? It includes freedom of press, freedom of association, academic freedom, rule of law, constitutionalism, among many others. So as long as these are practiced somewhere and can be translated or transmitted into the PRC, then there is going to be conflict and there is going to be an effort by the party to reach out. This effort to shape the world beyond the party is part of the, is part of the party's day-to-day -day routine. It's not, an, it's not an influence campaign. It's not a one-off operation. It is simply what the party does. It's visible in the structure. It's visible in the resources. It's visible in the staff. Wherever you see a party committee, whether it's at the center of the Chinese Communist Party itself, whether it's in a ministry, whether it's in a state-owned enterprise, or whether it's in a joint venture, you are likely to find a piece of this influence effort being bureaucratically designated inside that, inside that apparatus. So since, again, wherever the party is, this is something that you are going to find and see. How have these efforts affected us? We've been persuaded that the, C the Chinese Communist Party is not ideological, it's not Marxist or Leninist, but is really some variation of, of capitalist. We have not responded to violence, coercion, or intimidation by or instigated by PRC officials against U.S. citizens and residents on U.S. soil. We often de debate our China policy in binary terms, engagement versus containment, a trade war versus negotiation, accommodation versus war. And lastly, we are persuaded that China's rise is inevitable, not something that is contingent, meaning we do actually have choices, and we do have options, and we haven't given up our agency. What is the harm of, dealing with, of not dealing with these kinds of operations? The most obvious one to me is that when, when elected representatives uh, in a democracy go through the, the sort of Chinese Communist Party proxy groups that are operating in the US or Australia or wherever else, and that's their access to their, to their ethnically Chinese constituents, you're becoming a tool of the party because those images that are transmitted back into China paint the picture that the West cares about liberalism and the protection of human rights for themselves, but it doesn't matter for Chinese people. You're becoming political props that the party can hold up and say, the, see here, they could rescue you, they're on our side. A second major piece of harm is that they distort the marketplace of ideas whether it's the kind of examples that, that Chairman Sherman pointed out with Hollywood, or it's the effort to control Chinese language media platforms, or to influence what think tanks and research institutes and universities are doing and saying. Um, it's not that they're necessarily just turning these things into propaganda platforms, but they're ensuring that critical voices and the full spectrum of views are not aired, thereby distorting the debate. A key part of this influence effort is not about the, the dissemination of disinformation or propaganda. It's about the medium and controlling the medium before dealing with the message. What, how should we deal with this going forward? I'd offer a couple, of, a couple of principles. The first is that we need transparency, a conversation, discussion about what the party is doing, what people's interactions with the party are, what kind of money they take, and for what purpose. The second is that consequences create risk. Beijing has not overstepped. It, is not, it has not gone too far because it has not faced consequences. Until there are real consequences for these, for these issues, there will never actually be a risk that they have to take into account. And the third and final one is simply that if you think about a foreign political party operating in our communities and on our streets, this is as much a civil liberties issue as it is a national security one. And so we should use the full toolkit of the US government to protect our citizens and to preserve the integrity of our democracy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mattis. And I'll point out that while well, today we are told that the uh, world domination of China is inevitable, um, 25 years ago when I was just beginning to run for Congress, I could find 12 books that told me that Japan would be dominating the world right about now. Um, David Shulman, 
is a senior advisor at the International Republican Institute, where he focuses on China and other autocracies, uh, influence on democratic institutions and governance around the world. Dr. Sherman. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sherman, Ranking Member Yoho, distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for organizing a hearing on this topic critical to U.S. interests and the future of democratic governance across the Indo-Pacific. I want to begin with a description of China's expanding interests in developing Asia and the key means by which the Chinese Communist Party is increasing its influence to advance those interests. First and most basic, China and its $14 trillion economy are trading and investing more than ever before across Asia. Beijing seeks to use this growing economic leverage to establish dependency on China across the Indo-Pacific. Such dependence helps China advance geostrategic goals, such as the protection of critical sea lanes and the establishment of military facilities to protect China's growing global interests. The party also seeks to legitimize its autocratic system of governance and development, looking to achieve acceptance as a great power without democratizing. Since this prospect is not welcomed by the developed West, Beijing hopes to first popularize China's model in the developing world. The party is using multiple means of influence to advance these expanding interests. I will focus my remarks on China's influence in the economic and the information domains. First, Beijing is expanding trade and investment with countries hungry for both. However, there are malign aspects to China's growing economic engagement. As has been discussed, many projects undertaken and financed by China saddle countries with unsustainable debts, creating a cycle of dependence. Corruption is also rampant in these deals. Corruption is not a bug of the Belt and Road Initiative, but an inherent feature of the program, with the goals to ensure China's companies secure contracts to carry out projects at inflated costs, and also to cultivate elites uh, to ensure a country's dependence, otherwise known as elite capture. In some countries, the resulting leverage has created significant Chinese sway over domestic legislation to suit China's interests. In the case of the Maldives, China's pervasive influence and corrupt ties with the former Yamin regime resulted in a change to the constitution to allow the sale of land, including entire islands, to foreign parties passed within, without public consultation within the space of three days. The China-Maldives Free Trade Agreement, consisting of thousands of pages, was passed through parliamentary committee in just 10 minutes. The party is also exerting influence over countries' information space, manipulating the narrative through what the National Endowment for Democracy has termed sharp power. China is stepping up efforts to shape countries' internal debates about their engagement with China, including by suppressing criticism of China's activities. The party has a large and expanding set of tools it uses to shape foreign media coverage of China and cultivate thought leaders, including through some of the United Front tactics that Peter just described. China's simultaneous influence in a country's economic and informational domains is a toxic mix. Beijing's information manipulation ensures the neutering of institutions such as civil society and a free media, which in a healthy democracy would expose the negative consequences of China's economic influence tactics. Beijing's efforts are encouraging a trend toward authoritarianism in Indo-Pacific countries. China's no-strings investments bolster the fortunes of illiberal actors eager to take credit for delivering much-needed infrastructure projects. The party also provides authoritarians training on China's repressive cybersecurity policies and offers sophisticated surveillance and monitoring technology. Beijing's influence efforts are only likely to intensify throughout the Indo-Pacific. As China's domestic challenges continue to grow, Chinese leaders are even more likely to seek quick profits abroad and use sharp power to protect China's interests. A continued decline in U.S.-China ties is also likely to intensify Beijing's influence efforts. In a potential bifurcating a global economy and technological landscape, China would view developing countries' dependence on China as ensuring that if they must choose, they choose Beijing. So how can the United States respond? China will not change its aggressive approach to developing countries unless it has to. To achieve this goal, Washington should focus attention on the countries targeted by China. This does not mean forcing countries to choose and side with the United States or reject Chinese investment, even implicitly, because such efforts are destined to fail. But throughout the Indo-Pacific, there are stakeholders determined to protect their democracies from the malign consequences of Chinese influence. The United States and its partners should empower these actors, investing resources and bolstering the resilience of countries targeted for influence. This can be accomplished through two complementary efforts. First, as mentioned, the United States, along with its allies and partners, should offer developing democracies alternatives to China's investment and financing practices and technical assistance on project negotiation and evaluation. 
Second, the United States must dedicate resources to bolstering the capacity of civil society, political parties, and independent media. Transparency is critical to countries' resilience against Chinese influence efforts, permitting broad public debate about how to engage China in a way that protects a country's interests. For our part, IRI is working directly with our partners in the Indo-Pacific to shine a spotlight on China's influence efforts and give them the tools to protect their institutions and their independence. It will not be possible to counter China's malign influence without a sustained U.S. commitment to bolstering democracy. Doing so is critical to preventing the spread of authoritarianism and defending U.S. interests in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Let me point out that China's policies are so extreme, so outrageous, that they have done the impossible. They've gotten Democrats and Republicans to agree in 2019. They got me to say something nice about the Trump administration. They are more powerful than the megawattage necessary to reduce the temperature to refrigerate Hades to below 32 degrees. Think about it. Um, We've got a great firewall in China, and one might, and, and I probably want to get some technical experts to respond to, to this, and I realize that's almost another committee. Uh, you know, for way less than the price of a one aircraft carrier group to cruise within six miles of an uninhabited islet, we might very well be able to uh, blow uh, a lot of holes in the Great Firewall of China and make sure that every Chinese uh, citizen uh, could see anything the world had to offer. Um, I'm going to have that be a, a question for the record, and I want to ask our witnesses, um, why are Muslim countries so silent with regard to the Uyghurs? Anybody have a comment? Yes. can comment on that. I mean, part of what we've discussed here today with the influence and the leverage uh, that China achieves through the Belt and Road Initiative and its growing just gravity, um, uh, center of gravity as an economic powerhouse, uh, has an impact, obviously, on a lot of these Muslim countries, I believe. And it, it's, 50%. It's, it's universal. It's not like Mali has, issued, has, has done something or Indonesia or, uh, uh, you know, Morocco. It's... Air, the only Muslim country to say anything, and they were kind of forced into it, was the Turkish government, and that's just because the Uyghurs are not just Muslims, but also Turkic. But right, uh, and that was a change. The, the, every so you're saying this fear of China exceeds Muslim solidarity from North Africa through Southeast Asia. I, I, I think that China is the number one trading partner for over half of the countries in the Organization gotcha. for Islamic Cooperation. Yeah. Legitimacy, governmental legitimacy is critical because the question that people always ask is why are those folks running things? Monarchy answers the question, worked for several millennia. Theocracy works, uh, works fine in Iran. It answers the question why are these folks running things? Uh, Marxist Leninism was a theocracy, um, but nobody in Beijing is the vanguard of the proletariat. It's as if what happens to Iran if the Ayatollahs are still running things, but they become a group of pork-eating atheists. Um, so they have to be, they have to delegitimize democracy in order to prevent themselves from being relatively delegitimate. And they have to support um, uh, authoritarianism uh, in its many forms as, as an alternative. Uh, I want to turn the attention of the panel to a, uh, and, I, and my colleagues to a bill that I'm working on. I call it the China Debt Trap Act. And what it would do is just tell countries that have, like Sri Lanka, signed these deals where they owe a huge amount of money for an infrastructure project that won't pay for it, and just say, renounce the debt. Now, why don't countries renounce the debt? Well, 100 years ago, they didn't renounce the debt, or 150 years ago, because the Marines uh, would land and take over the port and make the country pay its debt. We don't do that anymore. You don't have to pay your debt if you're a country unless you worry about your credit rating. So what this act would provide is that 
no U.S. person could give somebody a lower credit rating or fail to make a country a loan just because they had renounced Chinese debt trap debt, which would be defined as debt where uh, we'd give the Chinese a chance to bring the deal to us for evaluation in advance. So if we certify that it's a fair deal, that's it. But any other time, if, they, uh, if there's this debt, we could look at the deal, decide it was unfair, and invite the country to renounce it. Um, any comment? I'll, it would serve them right, but I'll the take way. a stab at that. I, I think it's a it's a good idea. I think I'd point out two two thoughts, which is one, in a lot of these countries, including Sri Lanka and others, where they've gotten into serious debt to China, part of the problem is that once they get into this cycle of debt, they need to continue to finance these projects that have been started. And unless there are alternatives, they feel like they have to go back to China. So in the case of Sri Lanka, once the Rajapaksa well, regime fine. is kicked borrow out. Borrow the first, then borrow the second, then borrow the third. Raise your debt to two, ten, twenty trillion dollars, and then renounce it all, <laughs> and then still have complete access to all the Western financial institutions. Uh, Sounds like a plan. If there are alternate institutions that are willing, well, yeah, to I mean, not that we would build another harbor for them for free, but they'd be no worse off for wear. They could take all the money China extends and tranche one, two, three, and four. And then not have to pay and still have total access to us. So uh, it, may I respond yes. just to um, piggyback off, off right. of Dr. Shulman's comments? Um, I think any avenues for countries that are working with China to talk about China in multilateral settings or in other bilateral relationships are welcome. Um, and I will give you the example of the IMF in Pakistan as, uh, as something to follow. Um, we don't have a lot of information on Pakistan's loans with the Chinese. They stopped mm -hmm. sharing it. But they're cash strapped and they needed to approach the IMF because they're in a foreign exchange crisis. And the IMF said, we will not give you a deal unless you share information about these <clears throat> loans. And the deal is almost complete. And we've it's my understanding that that information has actually been shared. And so, it, you know, what Pakistan won't share publicly as part of a bilateral deal with the Chinese, I think it's more willing to share when it needs it. I think you've got a good focus on disclosure. I want more. I want disclose the bad deal, borrow more in a second bad deal, borrow more in a third bad deal, and then renounce all the debt. With that, I yield to the ranking member for five minutes. I want you to be my banker, so I <laughs> debt forgiveness. But it is a strategy, and I, I want to applaud the chairman for giving credit to this administration. I, I think that, that no, I hope that doesn't go. I hope it does go public for you because I think it's a good thing because it shows that we're focused on what's best for America. And um, I think the chairman brings up an important point about the Spratly and Parsley Islands in that it's a worthless piece of real estate. I think you said, but I I, I think it at it of it differently in that it is a strategic area for China for the Indo-Pacific. When you have a country like China that lays claim to their uh, historical nine dash lines and they said that this is where we sailed so it is our land even though the world courts ruled against China and they make claim and I think Doc, uh, Ms. Chadra you brought this up or it might have been Dr. Kleiman. Nobody's challenged them. You know the Philippines sued them in the world court uh, China lost. They built World State Idol. Um, they've in, uh, in turn or um, imprisoned, you know, one to three million Uyghurs with concentration camps, possibly crematoriums. The world has stayed silent. Um, and if we don't challenge them, they're going to continue to grow, and they, they've got their eyes on the Arctic now. And so the Parsley Islands is what I see is a second line of defense for mainland China. Then they're going to move to the Micronesia countries, or Oceania, and then that'll be a third line of defense. And I think it's important that we as a nation, not just us, but the, uh, the free world stands up to China. And I've got a question here about the ASEAN bloc of nations. Um, what are the, um, what, what can countries in the Indo-Pacific do to curtail Chinese influence and deter in interference, specifically the ASEAN bloc of nations? Does anybody want to talk about that? Sure, I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, China has made a systematic effort to 
divide ASEAN through cultivating certain leaders in countries like Cambodia to torpedo the organization from having unity. I think from a kind of US perspective, I mean, this often gets back to the kind of funding journalists on the ground and trying to create societal conditions that will make it harder for China to capture elites in places like Cambodia and elsewhere and essentially be able to use ASEAN members against the larger organization. So I think to, to me, I mean, ASEAN, until we can get at some of these members having been co-opted, it's not going to be a terribly effective organization as a whole pushing back on China. Right. And what we've seen is a very aggressive China buying off influence or buying influence, um, breaking diplomatic ties with other countries like Taiwan, and they're going to continue to do this until we push back. And we've been very vocal on this committee and uh, individually. Uh, when I've talked to the ASEAN um, leaders of their bloc, you know, we know what the, the, the original 10 blocks said that we don't interfere with the politics of another nation. But we're at a different time and place in history with world powers juggling for uh, preeminence. And China has got a very clear stated position that they want. It's time for China to take the, the world center stage, according to Xi Jinping. And we've implored the, the chairman of the ASEAN Bloc of Nations that you need to come together as a Bloc of Nations to resist the aggression of China, especially in the South China Sea or the East Sea, and uh, understand it's not just you. It would be us, Canada, Great Britain, France, Japan, South Korea, India, and Australia. And if we collectively stand up against China, China will get the message in one sense, militarily. You know, that's a formidable force. The other thing is, and nobody wants a, a kinetic in, uh, conflict. I think we need to have economic repivoting in manufacturing in the world. And um, I like to refer to it as ABC, manufacturer anywhere but China and encourage our manufacturers to go because we are feeding the very machine that's having this aggressive nation or aggressive actions. And the only reason they can do that is because so much is made in China. And so I think we need to repivot um, the manufacturing hubs of the world so that we're not indebted to a China that produces pretty much everything. And we had um, um, the AmCham come in and we've said this to multiple organizations that do manufacturing in China, and they, they, they all freak out. Oh, it's such a big market, 1.3 billion people in, in China. We've got to have this market, but they sell their souls for profits for the boards, you know, for the stockholders. I want to take them by the shoulders and point them to the rest of the world. There's six point some billion people over here. Let's focus on this market, move manufacturing over there, because if we hit China economically, and I don't, I, I don't want to damage China, I want the Chinese people to be successful, but not at the expense of my nation or our allies. And I want countries free to choose the system they want. And um, what are your thoughts on that to get manufacturers to leave, or how realistic is that, if I may? I think it's, it's a very interesting idea. I mean, you could even think about, with supply chains now, anecdotally, anecdotally, we've heard of companies now rethinking about with the tariffs, do you keep your manufacturing in China because suddenly people are hoarding key supplies with the tariffs. You could even imagine, for example, legislation that would essentially give tax breaks to companies that are U.S. in China, but then are taking their supply chains there and slowly moving them to essentially whether it's here or other regions. So I, I think it's a very intriguing idea. I'm out of time. Thanks. Thank you. I'd point out that America does not seek a $300 billion trade surplus with China. Uh, we'd be right. fair. Uh, we, you know, fair and balanced is fine with us. Uh, although the fair and balanced slogan may already be taken. And I, uh, you, we give five minutes to the uh, gentlelady from Pennsylvania. Yes. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, I had the opportunity of meeting with some business people in my community last week who have been working for the better part of a decade with outreach to Asia and specifically to China to bring uh, joint ventures together uh, to find sister city relationships. And they were very excited and enthusiastic about the opportunities that they saw in this in sort of growing businesses with a very large market. Uh, and this wasn't necessarily in the manufacturing space. I, I personally have a great deal of experience in the Asian, uh, particularly China manufacturing. Uh, world, but this had to do with farming and agriculture, it had to do with tech transfer and that kind of thing. So my question to you all is, 
I recognize as a business person, I recognize for my community that uh, growing your businesses and expanding to uh, newer markets, large markets, is really essential. But I also uh, approach this with a degree of uh, cynicism and a little bit of uncertainty about how we can educate uh, the folks in our communities, the businessmen and women in our communities, to be cautious in their outreach. Uh, and how how should I bring that message without seeming as though I'm I'm de I'm depressing the economy of my community? I'm happy to jump in on that. I mean, there's there's probably a few ways. I mean, one, I think more and more businesses are going to see they're producing within China for China and thinking about essentially segmenting your business where China's a big market. Of course, companies will need to be there, but really having kind of your presence there for the local market, not using it as a basis for your kind of global supply chain, not necessarily putting your best technology there. Um, and so I, I think that would be how I'd frame it and just, I mean, all this sort of cautions up front with technology, I mean, going eyes in, knowing that ultimately China wants to keep its market for its own companies. It will take technology if, if they are putting it there, try to squeeze it from these firms. Ultimately, they will find the Chinese competitor here. So being cautious, but I, I, I fully understand your point, which is it is a large market, and so companies are going to have to navigate it, but I think with a lot of care. I guess, would, would you recommend that I maybe even have roundtables such as this where experts are kind of communicating the cautionary tales? Is it just, it feels as though that the conversation has been sort of belt and road and at the level of other uh, other countries and their relationship with China, and we need to be bringing it, in my opinion, down to the everyday of my community. Is there something that I could be doing to be helpful in educating my community? I would imagine, I mean, more so certainly than uh, myself here, but I mean, business experts who have been there for a long time or navigating the market understand it. I mean, I think there would be a lot of benefit. Um, I'm sure you could find folks who could give kind of a best practices who've been there for a while. Does anybody else have anything to add to that? Yes. The, if you want to do business in China, do business in China. Go there and make the relationships yourself. If it's coming through one of these organizations, whether it's a Chinese Chamber of Commerce, whether it's a Tongxiang Hui, the hometown association, whether it's a sister city type of relationship, this is actually controlled by the influence bureaucracy. If a foreign country was thinking about doing business in the United States and CIA was the, was the sort of the vector for making that happen, people would sort of say, well, ah, maybe not. So why should it be any different when we're dealing with the PRC? And so if you want to do business, do business. But as you said, you know, some of these are about tech transfer. The, this influence system is as much about building talent recruitment and tech transfer and making sure that that expertise is available. You mentioned it in agriculture. Dutch security officials, Spanish security officials, Australian security officials, Taiwanese security officials have all told me about how they were kind of puzzled how agricultural products, seeds, um, also in the United States, that these have been targets for the intelligence system, for the influence system to bring that expertise back. So it's a question of, are you seeing an opportunity that's genuinely there, or isn't an opportunity that's being given to you to sort of suck you into the PRC so that you can be exploited? Just, just quickly on that, too, to bring it back to the developing Asia perspective, this is the same thing that's happening in all these countries, in these, develop, in these developing countries in Asia, where people will think that they're engaging with the Friendly Business Association. And so part of what I and I and others are doing is, you know, trying to educate on, you know, this is not exactly who you think you're dealing with. This is related to the party, to the United Front sort of work. Um, and you need to go into this with eyes wide open, perhaps. And as Peter said, perhaps go and go to China and create those relationships on your own, as opposed to letting these organizations with this background come to you. Thank you. I yield the balance of my time back. The gentleman from Florida, I guess, has left, so we'll go to the uh, gentlelady from Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hosting this hearing, and thank you to our witnesses uh, for their time. With tensions over trade escalating and the uh, Chinese vice premier <laughs> headed to Washington, Thursday for resumed talks, I appreciate this timely opportunity to learn more about China's attempts to uh, erode America's influence. I, I come from a trading state, the state of Missouri, where exports uh, support 88,000 jobs. That's 18% above the national average. I strongly believe that China must be held accountable for its malign trade and investment policies, but we must be targeted. American consumers and businesses shouldn't be the ones shouldering the consequences. 
I believe our trade policy toward China should be aimed at curbing the predatory behavior of China's state-owned enterprises, these SOEs. Uh, Dr. Hyman, <laughs> how should U.S. negotiators address this issue in talks? It's a great question, certainly very timely. I mean, my view is that ultimately U.S. and Chinese economic objectives are squarely non-aligned, that China ultimately wants to dominate kind of the key industries of the future. And if you look at sort of any deal on the table already this week, it became apparent the Chinese were walking back from their commitments. Mm -hmm. To me, that's it's deeply unsurprising. Uh, I think any deal, if one is struck, will be unsatisfying, I think, to, to the House, to the Senate, to the American people, given the nature of what China wants. Uh, relative to the United States. So I don't think there's a straightforward intra sort of answer to your question. I mean, I think I I at the end of the day, it will be about sort of protecting the industries um, here where China's going to exploit us, trading in select areas that uh, perhaps are not as competitive with them. But I don't think there's sort of a, a, a very easy or painless path forward. Oh, well, clearly, and uh, obviously the vice premier is on his way and the president's saber rattling. So we'll see where, uh, if we make any inroads uh, here this week. I want to make sure, though, that my farmers and my consumers uh, are not uh, inadvertently uh, and overly uh, affected by this. Beijing allows its uh, state-owned enterprises to borrow at extremely low interest rates from public financial institutions. As a result, SOEs have dominated uh, project bids in Southeast Asia, a primary target of the Belt and Road Initiative. I co-chair, uh, I'm uh, co-chair of the Congressional ASEAN Caucus, and I'm deeply concerned that these policies are designed to draw Southeast Asian countries into Beijing's sphere of influence. Dr. Kleiman, um, how should the United States work with Southeast Asian countries to prevent these state-owned enterprises from boxing out more responsible investors? Congress has already taken an important step in that direction, passing the BUILD Act. I would say I'm cautiously optimistic with our new development finance corporation that some of the tools it has, including new tools like equity, mm -hmm. um, as well as, of course, the new lending cap, if targeted, could help to move the needle. I think. Many of the countries in Southeast Asia understand what Chinese SOEs bring is not necessarily well engaged with their economy. There's not the skill transfer they right. want, the debt issue. So I think the problem for the U.S. until now has been we didn't have an alternative easily available. That may change with this new DFC. I think there's a critical role for Congress to make sure the DFC is lending in some of these countries in support of U.S. companies in competitive sectors. Um, but I, I would say I'm optimistic that we now actually have that tool. Dr. Schulman, um, the, the Xi regime faces internal pressure stemming from demographic uh, issues, simmering dissent, and, and high expectations regarding economic performance. Given these dynamics, I think it's important to remember that the Belt and Road Initiative was originally a domestically oriented initiative designed to spread economic growth to quickly growing cities in China's interior. Uh, Belt and Road Initiative has now evolved far beyond its domestic origins and threatens to undermine democracy and good governance in developing countries. Do you think this shift was opportunistic or accidental? And how should China's internal pressures from uh, inform our thinking on the Belt and Road Initiative? Thank you for that question. I think it's absolutely right to point out the fact that the Belt and Road initially was very much domestically focused uh, to benefit China's uh, West in particular. Um, I think it's important to note uh, that why, you know, in terms of why it's become such a big deal in terms of external um, economic engagement, uh, China's looking to create external markets to be able to sell its goods elsewhere. They're also trying to export um, its overcapacity in a lot of industries. Um, but it's important to note that actually, you know, when you look at the data, the Belt and Road actually has not been very beneficial for China's domestic economy uh, going forward. Um, what I think we need to look look to is going forward, as I mentioned in my in my remarks, if uh, China's economy continues to face mounting challenges, as we see that it is, uh, with the massive amounts of debt that they're taking on domestically. China is going to continue, I think, to look to the Belt and Road um, as a way to get them out of this problem, right? To create new markets and also um, to try to continue to saddle countries with these debts. And to come back to your question to Dr. Kleiman, it's not just that SOEs are getting subsidized and therefore able to come in with lower bids. It's that the Chinese policy banks that are financing uh, the, these projects 
are then going in with these governments and saying, okay, and there's going to be one bid, and it's going to be from a Chinese SOE, or maybe two bids, both of them Chinese SOEs. And so you're going to have a situation where you have very inflated costs uh, with corruption inherent in all of these deals. Um, so it's not just the subsidizing, it's also the opaque nature in the way in which these deals are done. And to expose that um, through uh, civil society and investigative journalism is really critical. Thank you, Dr. Shulman. I've, I know my, my time has elapsed. I have a really awesome question for you, Ms. Chaudhry, and I am going to make sure that it gets submitted to you. It's about India um, uh, that I'd love if you could respond in writing. And I thank, for the, thank the chair for his We all look forward to reading the awesome question <laughs> and the even it's more awesome, awesome answers. <laughs> Two items for the record. First, uh, tomorrow China's uh, Vice Premier Liu will be in Washington, D.C. This uh, Subcommittee has invited him to either meet with the subcommittee or the full committee, his choice. Uh, he has uh, not responded, and my fear is that if he watches this tape, he is even less likely to respond. And, uh, and for the record, I'll comment that while I've commended uh, President Trump for not ignoring the problems with China, and I think he's got it right in some ways, there are other places, areas where uh, I disagree with his policies, <laughs> and uh, if the committee demands that I spend 15 minutes explaining that, uh, I will wait. I will ex exceed to that demand. But in the meantime, we'll recognize for five minutes the gentlelady from Virginia. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, I was struck by what you said, Mr. Mattis, in talking about the Chinese believe that national security is achieving the absence of threats and, and further continued um, your discussion to say that there are really no consequences to China, so they take no risk in a lot of what it is that they're doing. Uh, so I was curious if you could expand upon that kind of premise of thought. What do you see are some of the consequences that the United States could put in place or, are, or could expand upon that could create risk for China that might impact their behavior and positively impact uh, our national security um, uh, situation vis-a-vis -vis China? So one of the easy ones that would be, that's been in the news for the last, I think, year and a half is the issue of visas and Chinese government officials coming through the United States, whether in some cases to intimidate people or to, um, or say, education officials going to universities for the purpose of overseeing a party committee meeting or to directly send messages to students. That strikes me as activity that is inconsistent with diplomatic convention. Um, in some cases, this may fall afoul of some of our civil liberties legislation, and these are clearly grounds for, for declaring a diplomat persona non grata. If it is someone who has come in without, without diplomatic accreditation, then you're talking about something that is akin to visa fraud. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you necessarily have to arrest them and hold them maybe you charge them after, but making the point that this is something that is considered off limits is, is important. If it actually does involve sort of more direct criminal acts, as might have been the case in, say, the Olympic torch relay, then it does mean that we are going to have to bring those, those tools to bear. Um, for Chinese companies that have been on the receiving end of stolen intellectual property, They've still been able to do business in the U.S. and elsewhere. Um, is it, you know, whether it is, I know there's legislation being considered f um, to punish those companies directly. But again, what is the possibility of using criminal indictments for the people involved and, and restricting their travel abroad? Um, I think in many of these cases, when we, when we try to make the issue about the PRC or the party writ large, we end up looking at this big, complicated mess when the response might actually best be made to make it personal mm -hmm. so that the individuals that are involved have to make the decisions and have to calculate for themselves. Thank you. Um, and my next question is for uh, Dr. Chowdhury. You, you talked briefly about the counterterrorism efforts and the different pivot that China has versus Pakistan. And so I'm curious, from a, a U.S. counterterrorism perspective, where do you see that our relationship with Pakistan 
working to address the threat of terrorism could be potentially impacted um, by the relationship that Pakistan continues to develop with China and whether or not that might uh, sway, change, impact their um, their focus on the on the terrorist threat and how that might impact our relationship with Pakistan in addressing that threat. So in general, I think that it's been a good thing for U.S. interests that the Chinese have gotten involved in Pakistan's security issues. They always have been involved a little bit, but more privately. And what we've seen in the past decade as kind of the threats have um, expanded and become more amorphous, and with the, you know, also ISIS expanding, we've seen the Chinese become more interested in Pakistani stability. And that coincides with you know, the state becoming increasingly fractured, relations between civilians and military not going well as they do in Pakistan. And so I think the Chinese um, realize that they have to become a little bit more engaged and active and also at the prodding of the United States. I mean, we really, and I was in the administration at that time, we really were curious why the Chinese weren't concerned about Pakistan's stability. It's their neighbor, frankly speaking. They have much more skin in the game for the long term than the U.S. does, ironically, with the thousands of troops that we had. Um, so in the short run, I would say it's a benefit for us, especially because the Chinese have gotten involved with um, talks with the Taliban. They have different avenues into that conversation on the conflict in Afghanistan that the U.S. can benefit from. We really have lost a lot of influence and leverage in our relationships with everyone in the region. And so um, anyone else who shares or overlaps with those values, I think that's a benefit. Over time, it's going to be much more difficult to pursue our counterterrorism interests in Pakistan. And this is because we don't have the relationships with the institutions and also with the individual leaders that we had, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And that's simply because we are not putting that much money into the country um, and we're not focusing beyond counterterrorism. And I'm not here to argue that we should put more money at this point. I think that we really tried everything we could. But as the Chinese are pursuing a very specific focus on security related to the Uyghurs, they are not concerned about overall stability for the country, only for their projects. And so with that, I think the U.S. has to think about the nuclear proliferation threats, the possibility of China and Pakistan working more closely together on that, and what do you do about anti-India militants in Punjab, which do destabilize the region, and China's not really doing anything about that yet. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Now recognize the gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, listen, I just wanted to give you all the opportunity to sound off on this. If you have anything profound, anything mind-blowing <laughs> that you'd like to say about what you perceive some of the biggest, a biggest weakness of China to be that you might think uh, we're missing. Do you have anything mind-blowing or profound to say about uh, a weakness you think we're missing on China? I hear crickets, so I might have to move on to the... I'm happy to, to jump in on that. I think at the end of the day, I mean, the economic model they're peddling, while it's gained some success, I mean, it ultimately has enormous downsides. And you've seen a backlash. I think if the U.S. take advantage of the rising concern about Belt and Road investments, and again, emphasizes what we do best, which is skill transfer, things even like women's empowerment, we have an initiative um, for that run by OPIC. Um, there's a real opportunity here. I think sometimes it's easy, even here in the U.S., to be sort of dismissive of our ability to rise to the China challenge. I think ultimately China has great weaknesses, especially sort of the, the long-term appeal of their economic statecraft. So I would definitely put that as a vulnerability. Fair enough. I mean, I would just add, I, I don't know if this is something that anyone's missing, but it's really important to note whenever we talk about China and the party, um, how insecure they are about their continued grip on power um, going forward. I think, you know, this is something that underlies everything that they do domestically, but also their approach to these issues internationally. And so um, even though we see a much um, uh, much stronger China on the world stage and a lot more aggressive rhetoric and a lot more uh, aggressive programs and the Belt and Road in countries all around the world, it's important to remember that um, you know when China holds meetings uh, at the Politburo level, they're frequently talking about what are the risks that we're facing long term in terms of um, staying, staying in power and, and maintaining stability. I would also add that something we haven't talked about today is uh, Chinese 
kind of people to people relationships. And that's something that I think is an inherent weakness if you compare it to the US and our ability to use our soft power influence through our entertainment, um, ev everything about American life that appeals around the world. The Chinese don't have that. And the Chinese nationals that are going to say Pakistan, for example, they're not there to become part of the culture or learn about the communities or have cross-cultural dialogue. They're there to make money and they live in enclaves and essentially what people call Chinese colonies and go to their own restaurants. And that's not something that's going to favor China, Pakistan or China cooperation with any country for that matter over the long run. Local communities will be um, very upset by those things, I believe. Interesting enough. I appreciate that. I wanted to go back to you for a question. I was interested by a lot of what you had to say, um, but I wanted to expand uh, the scope of some of what you spoke about. Do you see any place specifically in your analysis that you see China wanting to change uh, existing territorial borders outside of, let's say, the South China Sea? I, I don't believe I've, I, I could speak to that in the context of South Asia. No, I, don't, I have not seen that. Uh, if the gentleman who yield, I'll point out that there's a significant uh, territorial dispute between India and China, and uh, yeah. in the 1960s there was more than one armed conflict over that. Certainly. Yeah. Um, I, is there on, any place that you're assessing this? On that note, I would say, so there is a, a part of CPEC that involves Gilgit-Baltistan, which is a disputed territory, and India takes claim to it, as does Pakistan. And a good chunk of CPEC activity will be conducted in that space. It's the beginning of CPEC, in fact, for China. Um, there is some c push to incorporate that part of Pakistan officially into Pakistan. It's now just an administered territory. It's not an actual province. So there is talk of that, and which has made the Indians really upset. Um, but I, this is a very complicated issue, and it's not just connected to CPEC. It's connected to Kashmir. It's, con it's connected to other India-Pakistan relations. So I think specifically because China has involved itself in that particular kind of territorial dispute that it's going to delay the benefits of CPEC to anybody, especially local communities, but even for the Chinese. Chairman, well, I actually have no idea. Has my time expired? Your, your time has expired. Uh, uh, either I have incre such incredible love for the gentleman from Florida that I've let him go five and a half minutes over, or in fact he's actually uh, only held the floor for five and a half minutes and I don't think somebody the hit the red changed. button as opposed to the green button. Uh, but uh, we will now yield uh, five minutes to the gentleman from uh, 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 Virginia. And uh, yes, good, the green uh, button has been pushed. I thank the chair um, and welcome to our panel. Um, I want to ask about China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, <coughs> we are seeing signs of backlash to that project in recipient countries. For example, I was in Sri Lanka uh, two years ago, uh, and uh, what was predicted occurred. The Chinese state-owned company had to take over or wanted to take over Hanban Toda, a uh, brand new port on the southern tip of the island. Uh, and the government, of course, otherwise would have been insolvent, unable to pay back huge multi-billion dollar loans to the Chinese. Malaysia's new prime minister uh, questioned uh, the value of these deals, Chinese deals, uh, signed by his predecessor and made it an issue in his successful election. Uh, in the Maldives, the new president strongly criticized his predecessor's decision to agree to more than a billion dollars uh, to China for their projects. We do know locally, and I saw it not only in Sri Lanka, but in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan, resentment by local uh, labor uh, pools uh, because the Chinese are so insulated, so parochial, they don't use local labor. The ripple effects for the projects are, don't go far in the economy, uh, and it's resented. Uh, is this just anecdotal, or is there reason to believe that this huge project actually is going to be a lot less than the Chinese think it's going to be in terms of their foreign policy, their building friends and influencing people? Uh, and let me start with you, Ms. Shadri, and you, Dr. Clement, and then if you'd like to comment, you feel free. So it's a, it's a wonderful question, and I have to say during my last trip to Pakistan in uh, February this year, I heard the same sense of resentment and anxieties coming from everyone, even people that I wouldn't expect. I thought they would be benefiting from Chinese involvement. Now, 
there are reasons, there, there are things behind that. Those things might be anecdotal, the experiences that people are sharing with you, but there are things that we can look at and say that is why those people are feeling that anxiety. One is that you know we shouldn't let these governments off the hook. China is doing a lot of things that they shouldn't be doing, but these are, you know, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, elsewhere. These are governments that are weak politically and that are dominated by elites who have captured the economic system and are benefiting from those relationships with China. And then they get voted out of power or kicked out of power, or there's a coup. And then the next government is able very easily to use the relationship with China as a political tool. So it, and once it gets into that space, there's no going back, right? Now, there are some structural things as well. I mean, a lot of these countries, they have heavy, heavy borrowing from foreign lenders. They're cash strapped, they're desperate for foreign exchange, and they have their own inefficient companies running these ports, for example. They're not bringing in outsider experienced companies that are doing it. So there are both kind of political and also structural factors that contribute to those anxieties. And people aren't seeing the financial benefits in their pockets as they've been touted by their governments. And I think that's another reason why that everyday yeah, I, person. I, I guess I would just say to you, though, in the case of Han Van Tota, I went there. Yeah. It, was, it was a brand new port. and not it was pristine not a single ship had docked there was not a single cargo unloaded there was not a container in acres and acres and acres of, of a port and I've, I've been to ports i was shocked yeah. um and so you, the the sri lankan government bought you know american expression of pig and a poke and the chinese were only too happy to offer to take it over and manage it for the next 50 or 90 years and a strategic location where 30% of the world's shipping passes. Um, and that ought to concern India, and it ought to concern us. Um, the backlash, though, it seems to me, from a foreign policy point of view, serves U.S. interests. Oh, let me, you, so they're spending all this money, and they're unhappy as recipients, or at least the successor government is, Maybe we let that unfold. I don't know. You wanted to comment, Mr. Shulman. Yeah, I'd just like to jump in on that. I mean, I think the Sri Lanka example is a really important one because I think when I've gone there, contrary to what I would have expected um, when we talk as a, you know, in the China community about what happened at the Hambantota port, you would maybe expect people to be clamoring and saying, oh, save us from China. But in fact, you have a situation where China is actually quite still popular among the Sri Lankan public and the new government has actually um, continued to take financing. They just got a $1 billion loan from China Development Bank recently uh, from the Chinese. Um, the Hambantota port deal was, yes, partially about um, the fact that Sri Lanka couldn't pay back. It was also, I've heard, there was also some corruption involved with the oh. new Sirisena government, not just the Rajapaksa government. When, when I was there, uh, excuse me, when I was there and this was being debated, yeah, what, it hadn't been resolved yet, there was open discussion by everybody, including at high levels of the government, about huge payments by the Chinese to win over friends uh, and, and to get an agreement. So you have that elite capture aspect, but you also have this information manipulation aspect, where China is now, uh, it's rational, right, that they're going into Sri Lanka now and throwing a ton of money into Sri Lanka to try to shape the debate because they know that Sri Lanka is now the poster child for the debt trap. It's sullying the BRI brand around the world. And so when I went in and tried to find a researcher for our project on Sri Lanka to talk, to just look into objectively the nature of Chinese influence in the country, it was quite hard to find someone because all these institutions are now taking Chinese money and they know where their bread is buttered and they don't want to take that risk. So that just goes to the point that even though we see externally a lot of the downsides of BRI for these countries internally because of what China's doing and because of the relationships they form with elites, the message is not as widespread as you might think it is. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you would allow, I'm done, Mr. Clement or Mr. Mattis to comment. If there is time. I'm briefly, very briefly. Comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. China is very much making tactical adjustments, um, whether it's, China is making tactical adjustments, so whether you look in Malaysia, essentially reducing the cost of their projects. Um, they're also at their recent Belt and Road Forum trying to play up sort of new aspects of their investments, whether it's what they call high quality, green, financially sustainable. Uh, I think a key emphasis of U.S. diplomacy has to be going forward to call China on it, that they're not making real changes and emphasize what real change would look like. For example, massive debt forgiveness to countries, including those like Sri Lanka that are strategic for China, or terminating some of these really problematic projects, or bringing in international partners to the point where they're reducing their ownership below 50 percent. So U.S. diplomacy could play a big role there. Th thank you. Uh, we'll now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to yield a moment to Mr. Massey. He's got a question for the chairman. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to yield you a quick moment if you wanted to elaborate on uh, you advocated for a policy of uh, countries borrowing from China and then uh, not returning those funds. Would you advocate for that for the United States of America? We do not engage in debt trap financing. When a U.S. government entity makes a loan, it's with the expectation that the loan is affordable, can be repaid, and can be repaid out, normally out of the project's revenues. Glad to hear you when say that. China does, uh, tries to get extraterritorial power over Sri Lanka through a debt instrument, uh, we should respond appropriately. Just wanted to make sure I uh, yield the time back to Reclaiming uh, my time. Thanks, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the panel for being here. Um, I just wonder. In this whole negotiation regarding trade and other things, do you think that China was watching very carefully the outcome of the special counsel's report? Would that, do you see that as maybe affecting how they would have comported themselves in the continuing negotiations depending on the outcome? Anybody? Okay, nobody. Well, if you think about it and you have an answer, I'd be interested in hearing it. Just watching recently, China has been accused again of intellectual property theft regarding military secrets at colleges. Uh, they've been delinquent in enforcing North Korean sanction, continued unabated at their human rights violation, uh, continued its incursions in the East China Sea, uh, and abused the goodwill of America by encouraging intelligence collections of its visa holders in the United States. And I wonder, will China or would China view differently sanctions versus tariffs? I'm not a fan of tariffs, but we have limited options from my viewpoint vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, China. And, uh, but I wonder, sanctions has a different flavor to me as, as punitive, as punishment for bad behavior. And it might, the sanction might be a quasi-tariff, but I wonder if China would view it differently uh, if it were a sanction. And I, I'd like to get your view if anybody has. Well, I would just say I think you're you're um, uh, you're you're on the right track in terms of thinking that they would take a, a tougher view of sanctions. Uh, obviously, they're not a fan of of tariffs, but China traditionally has been very opposed to unilateral sanctions, whether it's related to the North Korea issue, uh, when it's come up in relation to Chinese companies that are involved in the South China Sea. I think that would be something that they would um, uh, react to very strongly and see as a a direct um, attack, and perhaps would uh, would. Um, would take um, action to uh, to take some sort of retribution to show their displeasure and say that China is now you know at a certain level is a great power and can't be treated this way and that's that's how China tends to to approach these things especially when it's unilateral sanctions and not sanctions that come from um, a multilateral body on themselves or others. So the sanctions based on that would have if they were going to have the positive effect the United States would be seeking would be better served if it was not unilateral but but if it was multilateral. Uh, and, and what kind of actions, other than being dissatisfied and, and, for lack of a better way of saying it, crying like a bear that's sore, uh, what kind of actions would they take vis-a-vis -vis the United States if they were sanctioned? And I, and I wonder, too, um, even, in the, even if, the, if it were fines, because you know, China is known to be washing dirty money, dirty North Korean money through our financial markets, and we don't... We don't have to abide that. We can find them for that. We can track that and source that and find that, them for that. And I understand that administrations leave space for negotiation, but we could start there, and the fines could be pretty robust. And then, and then we could freeze out certain components of their, uh, of their society from our financial system. And there's, an ups there's a downside to the United States as well to that. But they're in, they're in it for the long haul here, and we better get serious about it. So I'm just curious what they might respond to in that regard, how they would respond, and if you think that that would have potential significant impact, the financial sanctioning, so to speak, or fining. 
Well, I can't speak specifically to you know how they would respond without knowing exactly which sanctions uh, and which subject would be we'd be talking about. But um, you know, it's certainly entirely possible that they would uh, take some action to even further restrict access to the Chinese market to be uh, even more difficult in any kind of diplomatic engagement or negotiations. Um, but there's a whole range of ways in which China could try to take some kind of punitive action. Obviously, one of them, especially if it's related to North Korea, would be to um, play even. Um, harder ball in terms of allowing um, all sorts of things to be um, oil and other things to, to reach its way into North Korea uh, and not even trying to pretend that they're upholding sanctions. That's one way in which they might respond. Well, I've exceeded my time, but it almost seems like, with all due respect, it seems like we're in a position where, and I understand it's delicate regardless, but, um, but every day that goes by that we don't respond or act proactively regarding China, it gets, we're in a worse position. And so if, if we're going to do it, the time is now, as opposed to later. Yeah, no, I agree. I don't, I don't mean to be giving the impression that I'm saying it's necessarily uh, the worst course of action. I'm just laying out that I would think that the reaction would be much stronger than to tariffs. Thank you. And now last, but certainly not least, the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you all for coming. I want to uh, turn back to the uh, Belt and Road Initiative and um, focus on a couple of particular aspects of it. Uh, first of all, human rights. Uh, there are several examples of Belt and Road projects that have had negative implications for human rights in Asian countries. Uh, take, uh, for example, the big dam project in, in Myanmar or Burma. Is it the Myitsone, or how do you say that? Huh? Uh, Mietzone Dam. Mietzone, okay. So as Human Rights Watch reported last month, critics say the mega dam would cause large-scale displacement, and I'm quoting, loss of livelihoods, wide-scale environmental damage, and destruction of cultural heritage sites significant to the ethnic Kachin people. Ms. Chowdhury and Dr. Kleiman, in general, have Chinese authorities consulted with communities that would be affected by BRI projects, uh, like, for example, communities that might be displaced by major projects like this dam? I'm happy to jump on that. So we just did a, a global study at my think tank, the Center for New American Security, on China's Belt and Road, looked at 10 projects globally, and there was a pattern of disregard for local economic needs, local environmental challenges, local people. Um, that was not just in Asia, in Latin America, Africa. So this is it's a, a global issue. So the answer is broadly no. So we see the same pattern kind of unfolding in Pakistan as well. There are two areas of concern. One is in Gilgit, Baltistan, which I previously mentioned, yeah. and then two is in Baluchistan. Both are these areas where uh, the populations have not been well served by their governments, both their local or their national. And so there's fears of land grab and um, abuses of local workers, um, not enough local workers being hired. Um, and the government really has, I, my view is that in, in Pakistan, China has really outsourced its consultation to the Pakistanis. And because the Pakistanis don't really do any kind of extensive mm -hmm. consultation, none of that has happened. And it just aggravates kind of all of the center periphery kind of tensions that have already existed in the country for a long time. Right. So uh, in, in the Myitsone Dam situation, uh, uh, my understanding is that it's our protests of people um, opposing the project, including one in February that drew an estimated 7,000 people. So is this kind of opposition from the local population organized way like that unique? Did you find it elsewhere in your study? What, you, what have you found here? It, in the how case, have governments responded yeah. when people right. object when like people that? When people object. So that's a very good question. And my comments earlier on kind of critical voices being suppressed speak to that. Um, rarely will you read an article that's critical about CPEC in the Pakistani media. Very rarely. There's been a media capture, essentially, um, and there's only one CPEC narrative because people are scared or they've been intimidated or threatened not to do certain pieces. At the very local level, people who, who critique CPEC are often labeled terrorists. There are anti-terrorism laws oh. that can be used against them. Um, worse things could possibly happen. Um, so it's a very real threat, and it has already done a lot of damage to civil society and uh, democratic culture that's fairly vibrant, despite the country's history with democracy. And, and in other places? 
So in general, the trend is in countries with less transparency, more corruption, you tend to, even if there are protests, they don't actually accomplish a lot. They don't slow the Chinese down. In places that had more rule of law, accountability, uh, you saw fewer of these kinds of actions. Uh, so I would say it, it really varies in places like Indonesia, where there have been concerns about their high-speed rail. My understanding is civil society has played more of a role and maybe slowed that project down. But in other places where you don't, in like Burma, uh, it, it ultimately is going to not make the move the needle. So let's talk about the environmental ramifications um, of BRI projects. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, the construction of the Colombo port facility uh, has faced criticism over the land reclamation needed for construction and concerns that resulting coastal erosion might affect local fish populations, uh, threaten fishermen's way of life. Uh, have other Belt and Road pod projects pro pose environmental threats? And are there some examples of this? And how do you see this issue? If I could uh, comment on yeah, that, I, I think absolutely that's a, um, an excellent question because you know China's trying to paint itself as having the now green Belt and Road. Um, number one, a lot of the <coughs> projects that they underwrite are obviously in the energy sector and supporting lots of uh, you know coal and, and other sorts of projects that are not beneficial for the environment in these countries. And then you also need to um, uh, raise the fact that in a lot of these countries where China is financing um, projects that these countries cannot sustain, you ultimately get a result where um, where the countries need to tear down or, or go cross cut more uh, cut into more of their forests. A perfect example of this is in Ecuador, um, where uh, because uh, China was able to get Ecuador into a situation where it owed a massive amount of debt um, and ultimately now needs to pay back that debt in oil. 80% of Ecuador's oil is now going to China, despite the fact that the dam they built for them is not functioning. The Ecuadorians now are needing to go and cut into more of their rainforest to try to find more resources to pay back those loans. So the I've, reason why China is so welcome in a lot of these countries is because they don't have roads or any infrastructure in these areas where um, the government is essentially giving land to do these projects. And so, of course, there's always going to be the ecological damage. I think the problem is that the studies or the feasibility studies or the assessments aren't being done in advance. And I think that's a real opportunity for other countries like the United States to participate or just have their own kind of process of evaluating uh, the damage um, to, uh, of BRI to these in countries. In advance. Yeah. Yeah, great point. OK, I'm sure my time's Thank up. you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for coming, thank the members for participating, and we stand adjourned. On the website. Be, it should be on the website. It should be on the website. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it should be on the website shortly. Uh, I'm sorry, this is actually just my own personal. You don't have access. No, they should be Thank you. Uh, online momentarily. Okay, I'm happy to give you my card. Yes, okay, yeah. maybe you can post it on your website. Yeah, it should be posted on the committee's site. On your website. I'm sure it'll be posted on the CNAS website as well.